The Cartoonrific Podcast is sponsored by the Wonderful World of Animation Gallery, home of rare and wonderful fine animation art. Visit their website at www.gallery.com. And for our Cartoonrific listeners, you will receive a special 10% discount off any purchase if you purchase by March 25th, 2024. Just go to www.gallery.com and enter code CARTOON10 for your 10% discount. Once again, this discount is only valid until midnight, March 25th, 2024. Once again, visit www.gallery.com. The following is a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. Welcome to Cartoon Fun, it's Cartoonerific. Yeah! Welcome, one and all, to the Cartoonerific Podcast, Classic Animated Cartoons. I am Brian Mitchell, and I am your host. You know, there's some very interesting uh, bits and pieces of animation on YouTube and on Vimeo, and I happen to discover things just by the stroke of luck. A few years back, and I can't tell you how many years back, I saw something that blew me away on YouTube. And it was basically a reimagining of the 1960s series, Lost in Space. Now, Lost in Space was kind of this campy show. It was a sci-fi show. It was very serious sci-fi when they started it off. And then it kind of veered off into another direction. And sometimes shows do that because they sense uh, that there's more interest in certain characters of the show. In this case, it was... um, the Dr. Smith character on the show, which was played by Jonathan Harris. And uh, year, years later, um, after I had basically used to watch this show, I ended up working on a show with John, uh, Jonathan Harris uh, for a Casper uh, episode, The Spooktacular Adventures of Casper. I was fortunate enough to work on this particular cartoon. I had a lot of fun with it, but I was really surprised by that. And I talk about this in the interview with our next guest. But anyway, I had seen uh, this reimagining of a Lost in Space episode. And what uh, this gentleman did was he took a soundtrack from the original show with the music, everything, and he did some storyboards to kind of show how this would work. And it really worked well in animation. Uh, It started off in storyboard, and then there were some bits and pieces of scenes that were done. And then basically it goes into the title sequence, which was reimagined as a brand new animated title sequence. And it goes into full-blown color. When I saw it, I was like, wow, this would work really well as a show. And I just, uh, I thought it was the, the greatest thing. It's really funny how uh, you can get so excited about something in storyboard and a little bit of animation and then actually seeing the color. And um, and so anyway, I saw it, I loved it, and then I f- forgot about it for a little bit. And it, that often happens. Other things grab your attention. A few weeks ago, I happened to see it again. I lucked into it again and I watched it and I still felt the same way. Like, man, they should just do this. They should give the guy... Uh, a ton of money to do it. And uh, and then I started doing a little bit of research to find out who did it because there was no credit on there. And uh, I happened to find out that uh, this gentleman did it. 
and I I was able to contact him and and uh, and get him to come on the show and talk a little bit about that and his career. He's worked for Disney, he's worked for Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, uh, Nickelodeon. He's worked for a lot of different companies in various capacities: uh, animator, uh, storyboard artist, director, supervising pr- producer of stuff. So he's uh, he's done a lot of different things. And I'm happy to have him on here today. His name is Scott O'Brien. He's an animation professional out of Los Angeles, California. And we'll be talking to him right after this. You're listening to the Cartoonerific Podcast, classic animated cartoons with your host animator, Brian Mitchell. And now it's time for our special Cartoonerific guest. Well... This gentleman has impressed me from something done 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, and uh, it's still online now, and I actually put it on our Facebook page. So if you go to the Cartoonerific Facebook page, you will see it uh, there. It's posted. So, you know, check that out. He, uh, He and I share something in common. We both worked on Animaniacs, but I worked on the original show. He worked on the reboot as an animation director, but he's worked on uh, a ton of different things. The reboot of Wacky Races, Future Worm for Disney Animation, uh, Shimmer and Shine for Nickelodeon, and, oh God, he's worked on Teen Titans Go and uh, Kick Bukowski and a a lot of different things. So anyway, please, everybody welcome Mr. Scott O'Brien. Hi, Scott. How are you doing today? All right, Brian. Thanks for having me. Actually, thank you for being here. I discovered you through a bunch of different things. You worked for Daryl Van Sitters, and you worked on the new Animaniacs reboot, which I worked on the original, but I've seen some of the animatics you did, which are absolutely wonderful. Um, Tell us how you got your your start. Uh, Basically, uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in Addison, Illinois. Precise, so it's a suburb of Chicago. Okay, about thirty minutes outside the city. Right. Um. Yeah, I grew up like one, I'm one of those people who always loved animation. Right. I always kind of knew I wanted to get into animation. How? You know, like how from a very early. Age. Uh, how old do you think? Three, four, oh, five, seven. I mean, maybe not three or four, but definitely by around kindergarten, like that, you start to get the bug of. I don't know what triggered it, but you realize like these are drawings. I right. think there might have been some, maybe even something like a Casper where they talked about animation where, oh, I get it, you know, and then you you start to try to do it yourself. Like my grandma worked at a uh, this place that had stationery for Amtrak mm-hmm. and she would, uh, <laughs> I don't know how she was getting the stationery and bringing it to me, but yeah. You know, they, they were getting it. rid of old stationery. Yeah, yeah, they're getting rid of the, We don't want to get her in uh, trouble now, you know. The surplus, yeah, the, yeah. Sur- the surplus. That's and okay. I had, like, these reams and reams of paper she'd bring for me. So having an endless supply of paper, like, really helped me to <laughs> feel like paper is disposable that I could draw and keep on going. So right. it helps the animation kind of, you know, feel. Right, right. Did you, uh, you said you got it from, like, a ca- like a Casper cartoon? Where you may have I seen think it? so. Like in Chicago, there is a lot of like there's a very like the syndicated TV was very a lot of animation, like these afternoon blocks, and they would have like Harvey Tunes, and then they would have the MGM Tom and Jerry's, and then they would have mm-hmm. you know on another station they have like you know Speed Racer and Looney Tunes. Kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. Channel Nine. Have you Looney Tunes? They were all kind of old, like Tom and Jerry. I didn't realize how old they were. I knew they moved like Disney, but I didn't really get it they, because they would cut off the beginning and end, so we didn't have the titles at the beginning to even know they were MGM. Oh wow! So it was they were, and yeah, the old Bugs Bunnies were always hard to watch because they were kind of brown, right? They kind of hey Doc, like his voice wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, those they, were kind of scary. They had I this crummy of... film chain that they ran the cartoons through and um, muddy prints, you know. And I, we had we had our fair share of that in New York. I mean, a lot of the Harvey tunes were muddy looking, you know. Had a color TV and you're watching it and it's just like, it's brown. And it could well, never... so there was a machine that would, sh- because sometimes it would, like, even like Lost in Space, it would, like, 
it would break. It would break while I was on TV. No. Like, nickel difficulties. I was like, what? <laughs> how, are this, how are they showing a movie? Yeah, I think uh, most other areas of the country, they had this stuff on tape. Like New York, I think it was on tape eventually. But there were always, there, there were, they would stop because of technical, technical difficulties that would happen. That's interesting yeah. though. That's funny. Um, <laughs> you know, they put these, you know, when the film goes through the, the, uh, the projector, it's like it, there's always like a piece of, if they're not cleaning it, there's always a piece of lint or some yeah. dust that's going to scrape the hell out of the, the film. And then yeah. every time you watch this film, it has like a new line through it. You know, it could be light or whatever. Or it has the yeah. dirt in it. So, you know, I, I understand that. Um, but I, I don't think anybody experiences that today because everything is on, uh, everything's digital now. So yeah, everything's been I mean, it was really, you, you could really feel like that's, there's somebody there working this stuff. Like sometimes you'd see like, you know, place commercial here, like on like Lost in Space or something. And then they put the commercial on real fast. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Kind of neat. You kind of saw inside of the process of it, you know. It's interesting. I know projectionists that used to actually put like a, a penny in the reel where it was going to change up. And when that penny dropped, then they knew to like oh, hit the other cool. projector. So, yeah. Interesting, right? Yeah, the old days. The old days. So <laughs> uh, when, you, when you were watching this stuff, were they... Uh, we're talking what the 1970s, right? Yep, 1970s and early 80s. I mean, I want to say until like 85. Like it, I felt like I was watching these same old prints, <laughs> and there was like something with Tom and Jerry. Like I remember when they, I didn't see a restore Tom and Jerry until I had moved out of my uh, house. I was, I was, it was, I had to be like 93, right? And so I was growing up and. There's one Tom and Jerry where the, he meets a, where Jerry finds a seal. I always loved it. Oh yeah, Jerry and the seal. And, and Jerry and the seal. Yeah. The, the seal's talking, and there's subtitles on the bottom. Oh boy! And they, I never realized that there are subtitles on the bottom, like as a joke, because it seals like saying, "Can you help me?" You know, right? Because it, the 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 copies that they were showing all this time were a little bit closer. Like the TV safe was like so it had cut off so much of the image, like you didn't even see that there was some. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I uh, yeah. I don't know. It was just like a, this wasn't like a Chicago station, was it? Was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a W, a local lo, like local channel. So. Right. It was called um well channel thirty two. Right. It was called. So whatever that is, I think then it changed eventually it changed to Fox. And then one what changed over to that I was like, Whoa, what's going on? Right. This isn't my same local station. No. <laughs> no. no, we had a we had a wonderful two lo wonderful local stations here in New York, which was channel five and channel eleven. And channel five I think had the Caspers and the Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Channel 11 had the Tom and Jerry's and the Popeye's. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and I don't know where the heck Terry Tunes went to, because they used to be Terry Tunes and they kind of disappeared. Um, all right. So when you, when you were about four or five, you were drawing already or? Yep. Yep. And, I was drawing and, and I was trying to, you know, playing with toys, of course, but right. you know, it was like part of the play was oh, trying to make, you know, little animated things, you sure. know, um, along with, you know, trying to make robots or whatever, like even when, yeah. And part of the creativity would stick with me, even if like a movie came out, like when star Wars came out, mm -hmm. there was, there's no toys. There's no toys. So that part of like the play, like, oh, I want a toy of this was drawing, drawing it, drawing R2-D2 and all that sort of stuff. You right. Know? I guess the, the Enough that when the when the real toys came out, like I was little, mm -hmm. but, but I sure knew this real R2-D2 toy, like they they screwed up the detail on his head. Like I knew <laughs> from draw from drawing it, it's like they got it wrong. How, right. who, how did they screw this up? 
I was kind of maybe. I, <laughs> well, I think when Star Wars came out, there were no toys, and I don't think there was even a plan for toys at that point. And I think, uh, I think it caught him by surprise. Kind of like um, there was a show that Disney did years ago called Davy Crockett, and it was a trilogy. It was a three part mini series on the wonderful. It wasn't the wonderful world of uh, color yet. It was uh, Walt Disney Presents, but anyway. They were not prepared for what happened because they did part one, which was very successful. Part two, by the time it got to part three, they killed off the character, which if they knew it was going to be that successful, they probably would have let Davy Davy Crockett live. But it uh, just started this craze in America because every kid wanted a coonskin cap. And... Mm-hmm. Stores were like whatever they had was sold out and it, they didn't even think about merchandising it. It wasn't until maybe, you know, I guess they put their merchandising crew, uh, they basically got them in gear and and uh, rushed out a bunch of stuff within the year. And at mm-hmm. that time they were they were doing they were going to do a sequel. But it, it's funny. They were just so unprepared for the Davy Crockett craze um, so the same thing happened with Star Wars. Star Wars came out. I don't think they really knew. They, I guess they just figured it's just going to be a movie that came out and people would, uh, you know, they, they might make a little bit of money off of it. And the thing went nuts. So yeah, you never know how the stage is set and they, they didn't see it. I mean, from my impression, when I was a kid, like I was really starved for sci-fi and there wasn't that much. They had syndicated Star Trek, which I thought was okay, but I I didn't like that they were all adults and there was no robot or any, anything, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, then when Star Wars came out, boy, I mean, there is there. It was like it fed this the exact void that was in the world where, and especially for some of my age, where I grew up with Sesame Street too, and mm-hmm. you know, I I remember seeing this movie. You know, it starts out and there's these two robots that are not dissimilar to Bert. And Ernie, right? Uh, that like relationship was very similar, and then from what my perspective was, it was like the door blew open. There were all these robot soldiers that came in, and a big black robot in a cape. Right, I was like this is this is the best movie that's ever come out. Oh my god, you know, <laughs> like it's everything I wanted. Yeah, because even like Six Million Dollar Man had like you know sometimes you saw like robotic stuff, but a lot of times you saw like just people and right. you know was it. it just want to see the sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> just want to see the sci-fi. Yeah, uh, that's what I, I guess. That's what I liked about Lost in Space. He had this robot, but he was a friendly robot, you know, yep. with some yep. intelligence. You know, yeah, pretty crazy, pretty crazy stuff back then. But I loved it, you know, and I, I guess you loved it too. So yeah, I hate how the future it doesn't have like uh, robots that kind of roll around like that. Like robots, they don't know. They they just make them stupid looking. Like it's yeah. the blinking mouth. That's right. right. Why are they making them look like these dogs walking around? I don't want to see that. Yeah. I want or the one I or the ones that they're making them like humanoid. You know, they're yeah. making them look like people. And it's like, just make it look like a robot. We'll be <laughs> yeah, fine, yeah, you know. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you guys doing this? You're wasting my time. That's right. You're wasting everybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> so you had okay, you had the cartooning bug. Did you how'd you pursue that? Um, um well I never got rid of it. Right. And, and, uh, in junior high, I continued to do it, and I continued to, you know, want to animate. And I had a super eight camera. I kept on trying to, you know, make my own things. And right. the show I loved the most was Lost in Space. So I kept on trying to make in junior high already, like an animated Lost in Space, where cool. I, I, I really, really wanted to 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 be a real thing because I felt like um. Like it would make a great animated series, almost better than it would live action. And I knew at that point, as time went by, it's, that was the eighties. Mm-hmm. Knew that animation in um in America, I felt like was dying. And I had discovered anime, like with like, uh, and I knew that their stuff was for adults. I was like, oh. You know, America could have stuff for adults. And then that kind of opened my mind to like, there's a whole other market out here for like, you know, animation for adults too. And that kind of helped to continue the kind of drive. But well, then I should make an anime lost in space. And then, you know, like <laughs> all this kind of obsession that you have as a kid. <laughs> right. So, so, 
had you had you transition did, when you went to high school? Did you have any encouragement from any of the teachers or about your artwork? Yeah, or? from I had I my art art program. I went to Addison Trail High School. Mm-hmm. Um, Robert and Sandy went there too. I didn't know him, but it was a couple years before me. Right, and we had this teacher. His name was Mr. Yakel and Mrs. Greenman. There was a very strong um, art department there. Right. Um, so I was able to kind of. You know, through freshman year, through as the years went on and sophomore year, like I was gradually able to have more and more art classes the way it was structured. I was very lucky that way. Yeah. And there's you were, you were. Was art staff yeah. where we would get like and if, if we get jobs. So like, say, like the uh, the um they were having to play like and that they they would go to the art staff and say, oh, we need this art for a play like Bye Bye Birdie. Right. You know, we need someone to do the art and and that we they had us do these little projects where we get these jobs and it was like silk screen posters. We go down, we had to photograph our art. We had to make like little, you know, using non photo blue pencil with the hatch marks. Like we had to actually ph- ph- photograph these things. It was really cool. It was a re- really cool to get that kind of experience and, and training. Like it's really how it feels when you get into real life as an artist. Right. You know, right. I think it's very unique. Like, from what I've heard, and nobody else I talked to have talked about experience like that, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I did a little bit of that myself um, with high school. Uh, I ended up doing like the posters for the plays, mm-hmm, and so I mm-hmm. put that together. So it wasn't it was using more the, you know, it was more design work than anything. It wasn't uh, yeah. you know doing any people in it or whatever. Just trying to come up with a nice poster that had just you know good uh good lettering and then you know something to kind of draw people in to look at it so you know that was the extent of what i did there <laughs> but well, it was like it's yeah. like a real job where it's like you know you can all judge your you know you when you personally do work it's like you, this is for you and mm-hmm. you know the teacher will grade it whatever but this is like someone who will come in and be like uh like a re- like I think this should be changed or that. And I think this is, it. you know, it yeah. was like real training. Like, oh, okay. oh sure. Sure. When did you decide that you definitely, this is what you wanted to do uh, as a career? Uh, well, as I got, I, I was thinking it all through high school, but there was really a lack of information out there in terms of like how to get there. Right. You know, um, there, you heard some people mention like Cal Arts, but it was like, it seems so out of reach. You know, it seems like such a dreamer thing for whatever reason. Well, you were near you know, Chicago. Like, you were near Chicago, so yeah. it's like, yeah. yeah, it might as well be on the other side of the world as far as you're concerned. You know, yeah, especially uh, then, especially yeah. then, like it was like, how do I didn't even know how? How do you buy an airplane ticket? I don't know. You needed a travel agent or something. It was all very strange. Like there's no internet, really, right? You know, right. Well, I, I, a lot of people at that school, at my high school, they were going to this downtown Chicago, work, go to school, American Academy of Art. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, well, let me try to go there, too, because it seemed like that's where the real training was in Chicago. The other one was the Art Institute, which was across the street, but that seemed like more fine art. Right. Um, and because I didn't really know, well, where do you go to school for animation? Right. You know? Um. And when I went to the American Academy, uh, you know, t- I went there for illustration and yeah. I got the live drawing. Um, and I heard a bit about Columbia that they had some sort of animation program, but I didn't really, what I had seen hadn't really impressed. I want to. No, that's all right. That's all right. I, 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 no, I this, is really pers- this is time, your perspective. It's your perspective at the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not saying that anybody's good or bad or whatever. It's just, but that's your, you know, I went to school of visual arts and I never, you know, I never thought it was a great school for animation. There was great things about it, but uh, that, w- that was in New York city. And I just, I wanted to learn from people that had worked on Disney films. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I had to kind of seek them out being, because I didn't go to uh, Cal arts. I didn't do that, but mm-hmm. Um, was there any point there where somebody actually said, oh, you know, this, this is a, this would be a good school for you or, 
Not, not really. Like whenever, like animation, Little Mermaid didn't even come out yet. Right. So animation was just this like this thing that nobody really knew anything about. Right. So like you talk to your counsel- counselors at school, they were like, well, uh, I mean, you could try this and that. My, my dad wasn't really encouraging. Like, um, you know, they didn't really understand it that nobody did art jobs. Right. Um, but I did, even when I went into the American Academy, I did had some, I did have some sort of basic knowledge where, where I, um, at the mall, they used to have these art stores. And I remember finding this one that said, just said cartoon animation, but on the, on the cover, like I saw like, oh, look at these. Cause with Tom and Jerry, I was always amazed that they, they looked like they were moving just when you would even like, even if to see a still drawing. Right. Right. Yeah. I understand why. Like I understood how anime worked that you hold a character and the mouth moves. (laughs) They do something else. But with, um, with like Tom and Jerry, like, how is it alive? How do they keep it looking alive all the time? Right. And when I got that book, when I opened it up, it was the Preston Blair one. Right. I was like, whoa. And that's where I learned about line of action. And over, I couldn't believe it. Like, actually, when I opened it up, I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to draw like. And this is exactly what I want to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had that and I was, I learned how to draw like animation style through that where you learn about, and <laughs> I mean, those books, you know, people kind of dismiss them, but they they show everything that you need to know if you are just kind of guessing, right? It's like, you know, anticipation, squash and strike, and it kind of get, even gives you an idea of like drag and yeah. overlap. It has every, all that stuff in there. Well, I'm, I just want to say one thing. President Blair lived in Connecticut. He lived. I, oh, I, really? Yes, he lived in Westport, Connecticut, and uh, I would call him. Oh, I would call him, and I could have drove there in about sixty minutes. I could have. Oh. I could have drove, gone, taken the bridges by Manhattan, then gone up to, uh, gone up to Connecticut. It would only take me about it, anywhere from an hour to maybe an hour and fifteen minutes to get there. And, um, but I used to call him and, uh, he would give me pointers over the phone, which oh, was, really? That's yeah, cool. yeah. And you know, the thing is, is that, and I wish he, I wish he was around for me to say this, he was a very nice guy, but there are people that have really influenced, uh, people, you know, people like myself and you and mm-hmm. by not meet by never meeting him, but the fact that book that cartoon animation book is one of the most important books for this whole generation from 1970s on to now. It is mm-hmm. basically, it's still in my library. I still look at it. If anything, Preston Blair helped train or, uh, you know, or uh, give uh, some motivation to this whole generation of animators because everybody has that book. Everybody I know that's anybody in this business has that book cartoon animation and yeah and it's amazing it's an amazing book the original book actually had mgm characters in it <laughs> i know from the 40s. i know that's what i was gonna yeah. say uh, daryl had shown me yeah like he was like hey look and i was like <laughs> <laughs> it didn't just look like tom and jerry it was, it was he just flat out used them tom it was jerry. tom and jerry yeah. it was barney bear i mean i think there's still barney bear in the book uh but uh there were other characters in there and it was just like Holy moly! And and what happened was uh, the the companies threatened to sue him, so yeah, he had to change. Sure. But I don't think they did. I think they allowed him to make the changes, and then he did. And so, but uh, one of the most important people. The other one I say is Eric Larson, who basically mm-hmm. brought in all these people, like Glenn Keane, tra- you know, basically oversaw yeah. all these people. Don Bluth, you know. Uh, John Pomeroy, I mean, the whole generation, all these people owe uh, 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 gratitude to uh, to Eric Larson, but the same thing, Preston Blair. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. We've talked about Preston Blair a number of times on this podcast, and everybody says, yeah, I got that book, you know, got it in, a, got it in some uh, hardware store, you know, and that's yeah. where I got it. I got it from a hardware store that happened to have a little art department in it where you could get some art supplies and that book was on a rack and I got yep, it and yep. I was so excited to get it, you know, and I was maybe 11, 
11 or 12. Did you, did you know about the book? Because I, I think a lot, you just kind of discovered it by accident, just by the cover of like, oh, look, you know, right. it seems like it's with all these other books that are mostly for kids. Yeah. But you see this and there's something about it like, wait, this looks like it's more. And you open <laughs> it, it's like got real advice. Like, whoa. Yeah. Not like the stilted advice from some of these other books from Walter Foster, which yeah, I don't yeah. know if you've seen these things. They look like something from like some really bad thirties cartoon. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't know who the author was, but, but I was like, nah, I don't want to learn that. I don't want to learn this stuff, you know? So, yeah. but that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that you got that. seems to be yeah. uh, Preston is still living on, you know? So yeah. Great. Right. <laughs> so you got that book and you started working from that. Did you, did yeah. you, did you said you had a super eight camera? I had a super eight camera. I got it for my eighth grade graduation. Okay. Um, did and it... then I, I had like a, I, I had, I made like a down shooter just out of, out of like, um, well, I had like the tripod and I put the camera on underneath and then I had this like little, it's either from an enlarger or a, um, they used to call them an enlarger where basically it was, uh, you know, like you can mount the camera on the top, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. I think it was, um, they used to use them in schools where basically they put a book on the platform and then they'd have this thing looking down and basically it would project onto the, uh, onto a screen of mm -hmm. whatever you put on the surface. So if you put a book and you wanted people to follow along with a book, they could put the book on the service and then oh, it would yeah. project it. So yeah, it may have been may have been something like that. Like that. Uh, no, it was just like it was just um it wasn't like an opaque projector like that. It was like just I would have to film it and get it developed. So whatever I was filming frame by frame that was underneath. Right. So it was just a tri it was just like a tripod with the Yeah, it was just a tripod. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So gotcha. So, um, was it, the camera was a single frame camera where it allowed you to take a single picture or? I, tr I tried to, but I, no matter how fast you do the button, it always looks <laughs> shitty. So I ended up having to actually go, there was cameras, there used to be camera stores where you can go and rent. Right. So I, I asked the guy behind the counter, like, how can I do frame by frame animation? He's like, well, if you rent one of our, now in hindsight, maybe, <laughs> but he's like, rent one of our cameras you could do it frame by frame but they don't do it with sound film right so if you want sound you have to after you after you shoot all your stuff you have to have it sent off to have it sound stripped right on it on it <laughs> it's, so, it's so archaic you yeah know? right so yeah and they and i so I, that's what i did i rented one of his that guy's cameras i, I filmed some stuff right like when there, the first time I tried, it was like I noticed I used like a very little bit amount of film. I was like, "Hmm, this is." And I, I thought, well, in my mind, I was imagining it was very long. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, maybe I should try and use two frames per thing, and that'll make it twice as. So then I went, and I filmed it again, but then I used two frames, and of course, it looked better, right, with the two frames because yeah, when it was. <laughs> Yeah, we just go by real quick. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. I went through yeah. all that. I had a. Yeah. My aunt had bought me a um, a Super 8 camera that had a single frame capability. She didn't know it. She no, just bought wow, it. Wow! Wow! You lucked out. I lucked That's out, cool. and it was uh, so basically all I needed was an attachment, which was a screw-in attachment for the frame release. It's on a cable, mm -hmm. and so I did it manually. And I was, uh, I had that camera for a long time. Um, how, how old were you then when you were doing it? <clears throat> probably 15, 16. Cause I, mm, I went to, yeah. I went to school of visual arts in 1980 and, uh, I'm about 10 years older than you were. Okay. Um, so yeah, no, that's, I used to, they used to sell these things. I don't know if you had Toys R Us's over there. Yeah. Yeah. They used to have a section where they sold um, like Disney clips and Warner Brothers stuff um, on Super 8. And I would buy Ian, these things. That, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. But they were like, 
you know, a silent reel for four minutes of like, you know, sl- the sequence from Sleeping Beauty where um, the prince is doing battle with the dragon with Maleficent. And they tell you a three and a half, four minute snippet. And I think it was maybe about, I don't know, seven bucks. You know, and if you want it in color, it's probably a few dollars more. Um, but they would you know, sell it. Now that you're bringing this up, like yeah. what what probably really helped me to understand animation, which I did have when I was like four years old, was a, the Fisher Price like movie thing where you, you yes. get to go frame by frame. Like it, it was, the, I think everyone had the Lonesome Ghosts, like right. Mickey Mouse. And yeah. Whoa. Like you saw, like you could control it and see like these ghosts coming out or water and all this stuff. It was like, you really understood like, okay, these are different frames that you're watching. It right. really had a huge impact. Yeah. It was, it was kind of amazing. You know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a revelation when you see how it actually kind of works. See how yeah. many frames it takes. I think even in those, um, because those came in cartridges, right? Yeah. 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 You'd stick the cartridge into the, the viewer Something like that yeah. would stick in and then yeah. you just, you know, manually do it. Um, I think they were cut. I think they were uh, cut frames in there. So I don't think it gave you a true idea of the timing. Because yeah. when you when you do it like that, when you're when you're rolling it through, you're rolling it at your own pace. So it's kind of like, you know, if it's going too fast, you'd slow it down. Yeah. But I think they I think they were cutting the uh, the film. They were cutting the frames. And uh, therefore, they could get maybe a lot more into like a, a, yeah. a one of those cartridges. It still gave you the concept, though, of like, all right, this is like one each image. This is how you see motion. You yes. Know? Yeah. I think that combined with the Preston Blair book on general timing, like the um, like a walk and a run and stuff like that, which was like one page had this is how many frames it takes to do a skip. And this is how many frames to, to do just a, a normal walk or a slow walk. And, you know, I think, or it even told you the concept of like keys, like, because mm-hmm. it was like, even when I would watch, let's like sans TV, like Scooby-Doo, right. Like how does it keep it the same size all the time? Right. And, and you learn when learning through Preston Brook Lair book, you know, Oh, they, they have keys. Oh, okay, that's more easy to digest. Like then, it's not as overwhelming. Of like, how do they do all this? Right, you know? right. You take right. a little chunk at a time. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, what when you discovered that book? What happened after that? It, it since it gave you a, like a little bit better of an idea on how to draw these characters and uh, a little bit about animation. Where, where'd you go from there? Well, I, this was, I was getting close to college. I wasn't doing as much animation then because I was just more working on art, artwork itself, but it did help my drawing. Mm-hmm. And when I got to, you know, do life drawing and they brought up a concept like line of action, it's like, okay, I, I was familiar with that concept. Otherwise it would have been the first time I had heard of it. Right. You know? Right. Gotcha. Um, but during that time, like then, then, you know, when you start to get older, it's not just about like drawing. It's like, well, how am I going to keep on affording, you know, continue to afford to go to school? Or what am I gonna do? <laughs> yeah, those so it's like I remember those... I was I was working at the store as a cashier. Oh, wow. From midnight until seven in the morning. And mm-hmm. then at seven in the morning, I catch the train to go downtown to Chicago to go to art school. And I would come home by like three thirty, crash at home, and go to sleep. Right. And then I do it again. You know, it was like five days. Oh wow. Away. Um, wow, that must yeah, have been tough. It's like not sustainable, you know. Yeah. It, including like it, I'm sure it impacted my education at that point because my my life drawing class in the morning I was okay, <laughs> but by the afternoon it was like oh, you're yeah. starting to lose it. Yeah. Yeah. Burn out. Yeah. Um, so what, what happened after, what af- happened after that? I'm just trying to um, get a well, gauge after, on, yeah. Af- after that, I, cause, because what was the big idea in my mind, God, it has to sound so stupid to, cause now my, my son's a senior and how, how much about the future he's 
thinking about. Right. But I was like, all right, I, I just had this vague idea. It was, um, I was like, well, I know I need to continue my art education. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had no idea how I was going to get into animation. I thought I was going to have to move to Japan, you know, because, <laughs> of the, because that's right. where they were doing animation. I didn't think right. that, you know, I could get a job doing animation here. Right. Um, I, I, I went to, because I couldn't keep on going to the American Academy of Art because I was just exhausted. Right. I went to this community college called College of DuPage, and they had this strong art program there uh, for illustration. Mm -hmm. So I went there for a couple of years, and in their library is where I discovered um, The Illusion of Life. The Disney um, animation book yeah. by Frank Thomas and Oliver Johnston. Yeah. Yeah. I seen that and that really was like I, I i like i guess i unintentionally like approached it like layer you know like first i had the uh, press and blair background and i got the <laughs> illusion of life like it's almost like the perfect way to approach it in terms of like being able to understand it yeah yeah because these concepts i learned from press and blair like when once i saw an illusion of life and they had the <laughs> I couldn't believe they were showing it like they had like the individual drawing. They were showing exactly how to do it, exactly how the keys were broken down, right. exactly how to draw rough drawings like these Freddie Moore drawings. That right. was like, oh, this right here, this is how I want to draw this Fred Moore stuff, you know, <laughs> seeing the red scribbles. And yeah. it was it was like, oh my gosh, it, 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 I couldn't believe they were giving away all the secrets. Like I felt like these were their secrets that well, this is how they keep the competition away, that they keep these to themselves. But, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, here it is. Here it is. Right. You know, I, I Xerox the hell out of it because you couldn't buy it then. Like, I tried to buy one, and they are like, $500 because it's out of print. It was out of print, yeah. At the time, yeah. Yeah, so I was... I, had, uh, I, oh, I Xeroxed it probably from cover to cover. <laughs> <laughs> I think around 19... I, well, I was at Warner Brothers around 1991, and... Uh, I had two copies of the book and one copy, I had a bunch of these animators sign it that I worked oh, with God. who worked at Disney. And, uh, one of the, one of the people I worked with who's been on the show, he came by and he, he was looking at the book and he said, uh, I'll buy this from you. And I said, no, nah, you're not serious. And he said, no, no, right. I want to, I want to buy it. I ended up selling it to him. Um, and I, I don't know. It's a little bit crazy. Cause I was like, I didn't realize I forgot I had all these autographs in it. Oh so no. He, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now he has, the. I think he still has the book, but, uh, I think, but I had another copy of it. So I didn't, you know, it wasn't like a, uh, I felt, well, I got the other copy. It's a better copy and this thing's like busted up, you know, but right, uh, yeah, right. I didn't even think about the, all the autographs they had in it, but it was, um, uh, Interesting. He didn't pay five hundred dollars for it, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got ripped off. <laughs> so anyway, so okay, so you got this book. All the information is in there, and then oh, did, oh, did that propel you? Did that now like you were like, wow, this is it. This is what I want to do. No, because I still didn't know how oh. to how to go about it. Right. right. Like I, 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 because I had no guidance, nobody I talked to knew how to get into animation. Right. Um, so then when I started, you know, I was going to, I was going to, you know, the COD, college mm -hmm. page. And then I, um, I got a couple of certificates in illustration, but I could have gotten more. And I started, to, I started to, my dad was like, all right, you better start looking for a job. So I was still living, <laughs> you know. So yeah, sorry. I started to look for work and um and in illustration because it was all about the advertising industry in Chicago. Right. And I immediately it was immediately very difficult where I didn't find anything. I was like, you know, I know so much about animation. I learned on my own. I've been studying this my whole life. I eventually want to get to do animation, anyways. Right. I, let me. Let me look. And we had to, there was no way to find out. There's again, there's like no internet really. Like I had to check out from the library, like this thing called the Chicago creative directory. Right. They had animation studios. 
I was like, all right, well, let me start with A. Or, <laughs> you know, I went there, I called them up. And right. this one place, uh, Senate, they were like, yeah, come on in and show your stuff. I had this portfolio of illustrations. Right. Um, and they were like, you know, we need some, right now we need some cell painters. We have this, this commercial coming up for uh, Crunch Berries. Crunch Berries commercial was Captain Crunch. Oh, and we need some. You want? Would you be interested in that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would. What what studio was, like, was it? It was called Sinnet Sinnet and Associates. Oh, okay. Um, and they, I guess they are the people who got. Well, I know they are the people who got Captain Crunch, right? The, they were the people after Jay Ward, right? When Jay Ward didn't do it anymore. Yeah. Um. So I went there. Um. And yeah, I started painting cells and they asked me because I had illustration background, if I could do some backgrounds for these commercials for Koala Yummies. Okay. And I was like, okay, let me try. And I, I, I was stuck by that point. I had, I had seen um, all this stuff come from this one hot new artist where I, I loved his stuff. And it was, it was Daryl. It was very Daryl Van Sitters. Oh, where. Okay. Box Office Bunny came out mm -hmm. and, and the Space Jam, you know, the for not it wasn't even Space Jam, it was my first Michael Jordan commercial. Right. And that was the animation I was really interested in. Like the snappy kind of slick, kind of cool. It looked like it was it was like it looked like the short, it looked like shorts, and but it was also like new and cool and and very slick and polished. Right. Um, so I had I had gotten these books like it was like Bugs Bunny at fifty years. I, I can't remember what it was, but and it I had all I know books. what you got. And you do you? It had like it a, a Michael, it's a it's a magazine. Yeah. It was like a, yeah. a limited edition magazine. It was a Bugs Bunny fiftieth anniversary or something yeah. like that, and it had an animation uh, facsimile cell in there from yeah. Box Office yeah. Bunny. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was ripping off. I had that thing open. <laughs> I was ripping <laughs> that thing off to draw my backgrounds. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. You know, that, that I was going for. And I was like, uh, yeah, it's Mike. Mike Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Um, so you got, you got a job working there full time. Mm -hmm. did you, well, I, was, did, did you still, I was still freelance i was still they weren't hiring anyone full time right so i was still like full-time freelance right so i'd still i didn't have insurance but i would i could go i was still working at the store and they were the store was union mm -hmm. so i was working like 15 hours a week at the store to get benefits and insurance right <laughs> and you know going downtown chicago to do that stuff during the day right pretty neat yeah. Pretty neat. Yeah, Did you no, discover the no. other animation studios in Chicago? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Calaba Calabash. Calabash. I quickly learned about Calabash because they were doing the, they also were doing the kind of stuff that I liked where it was like these little kids running around. It's very zippy, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I want to try there. I never animated with them, but I, you know, I was doing like cleanup and stuff like that. And in between and right. I remember taking their X sheets and, I'd see like ones, you know, and I'd Xerox them, the little X sheets, and I was really, right. I, I became, I, I became obsessed with animation and like, like just learn, really learn taking all these skills and really just obsessively studying it. Like every weekend working, every night working late. And right. Senate gained access to the pencil test machine. And then I started to, can can I try to do some stuff? You know, and the the guy who was the boss there, Mike Nicholson, he was, yeah, go, yeah, you can go ahead. And I mentioned this on the the Bancroft's podcast, but it was a big deal. Where I, you know, I I first animated this first thing and it sucked, and he was like, well, I'll try this and that, this and that. Right. And then my second approach was this little little boy trying to kiss this little girl, and the girl kicked him. Um, he was like, oh. he was like, oh, do do you like do you like MGM stuff? And I, I blew, <laughs> absolutely blew my mind. Like he could, oh my God, this guy could tell what I am influenced by just by looking at my drawings. Amazing, right? Couldn't believe it. It, yeah. it absolutely. And it was also like indication like, 
oh my god i am closer to like my goal of doing the kind of stuff that i love right you know? right yeah it's wonderful so, that's yeah. wonderful now no, right. when people say that to you it's like wow your stuff looks like this animator and it's like and then it and it's great when you, you that's who you're influenced by and it's coming through and it's like it's really working you know the people yeah. are seeing it so very neat um Where'd you go from there? Did you? How long were you working for these studios in Chicago? Because I, I think Startoons well, started up. Maybe Startoons was in uh, Homewood. Yeah, and we had heard of it like that. Like them, Startoons using people had um, yes, because that was kind of pretty far away. I lived in the western suburbs of Chicago. Homewood was more south. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And, once I started to, you know, once I was in the industry, especially in ink and paint, where you're sitting there in this big room, everyone's talking, Spike Brandt, or all these names are coming up that work at um, Star Tunes. Tunes. Right. You hear about, like, oh, they did Tiny Tunes and stuff. Right. Like, oh, I, I like that stuff. I think that's, that stuff is cool. Um, but I never went. I never went down there. Right. I know they were... Twenty dollars a foot or something like there's a they weren't paying that, they weren't that. paying that much. Are, <laughs> 20, it, was, it was like a, a a price that when when I came out to to you know L A uh, only a few years later and I got some Chester Cheetah freelance from Van Sitters. They were like, all right, we're paying one hundred and fifty dollars a foot. Is that okay? <laughs> hey? I was like, holy moly! Like I've been. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 like I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. You know? Well, how that how that transition happen when you went out to LA? What what made that decision happen? Because you're working. Okay, so you're working at this one studio, work uh, doing uh, uh, Captain Crunch stuff. Yeah. On a and we started to get more commercials. Yeah. We got this, the Mike had left and gone to these other places. Mike Nicholson. I was working with John Griff. This uh, other person, John Griffin, right. eventually went out to Star Tunes. And he was a director, and I was getting scenes. I had this alphabets uh, commercial where the letters were, the vowels mm -hmm. were surfing, you know? Right. So that was, like, the first, like, professional thing where you really saw. Um, and then Mike had gotten a job in the western suburbs where where there's cal no, there character builders in Ohio, mm -hmm. and they had gotten half of... Quest for Camelot, which didn't start yet, and they were recruiting, and they needed feature style animators. I'm, I'm sure I'm skipping some stuff up. I, I, I know there was like some. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Some CD, there was some CD ROM stuff in there at sure. some point when it's a big craze. Um, but they they were recruiting, and they they saw my stuff that I had put together because I have my own reel, you know, that of professional stuff that I'd done, and also like tests I did. Mm -hmm. Um, and they they had me take a test and they liked it. And then I worked there and that gave me a lot of working experience of like, okay, now I'm working on pseudo feature thing where it was like, I had, because they quickly, the Warner Brothers reorganizing and they quickly lost quest for Camelot, but right. then they had Pocahontas too, or Union Beast and Shannon, Shannon Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And that by that point, I had got, I don't know, I had gotten pretty good. I, I don't know why, but I had, I had, I guess because I was obsessive, <laughs> that I had really, um, I, I, I felt like, I felt more confident that I could, I can handle all these things. And because sure. I, uh, well, you were doing animation at this point, correct? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You're animating. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So I'm sure you were probably doing a lot of research on things too, like when you, got a scene and it's like, you know, sometimes you need ideas on how to approach it. And sometimes you go, I don't know if you did this. I, I know I would, I go back I and look would, at yeah. something that was kind of what I wanted. Yeah. And then kind of look exactly. at it, not copy it just to study it, you know? Yep. That's exactly what I would do. And at that point, when you started to get like VHS copies, mm -hmm. like that was another like revelation. Like, Whoa, look what I have. Right. You know, Put in like I remember like going frame by frame, like looking at. Did you have the I jog wheel? The jog wheel uh, for that? 
Um, at Character Builders, they they bought one for us. Oh wow! So I was there. I stayed there. I was there. <laughs> I, every weekend I was there late every night all by myself. Like I, yeah, my, my girlfriend broke it up with me. Cause I was like, <laughs> I, I was, I only wanted to do this animation. Like right. I was, I had, I was obsessive about it and yeah, you had learned how to, God, like I remember going through Robin hood and going through those when the, and I had all these like spiral notebooks that I would, I figured out that I could find out these where exactly their keys were. I would draw the key, like do a gesture, and then go. Right. I could find the other key. I would draw the next key, and I would put a chart there. Uh-huh. I mean, I was really studying so hard. Like I loved it, and seeing the like on Robin Hood, seeing those little, I, I love those little bunnies in there, and seeing the the pliability of the nose and the muzzle, and the way it would, and I would go in there. And, yeah. study that like I, I i couldn't stop yeah you know? i want to say don bluth did a lot of that stuff but i'm not sure but yeah I, his stuff it influenced me too mm-hmm. where yeah there's one thing like right before i was gonna leave character builders where i i knew i needed more lip sync mm-hmm. so i had this old louis pre not louis prima louis louis jordan song like mm-hmm. you got your mojo working and i used to listen to a lot of that kind of lounge mm-hmm. music when I was work in the 90s right and i was like i want to i want to do a bunny rabbit singing this song um and i didn't have enough lip sync on my reel right so i just i i put that in take two the song and i was able to i kind of went and painstakingly read the track put that on the x sheet and animated it in like a day and Mm -hmm. then there was like these girl i wanted these little girl mice to come up and i Reference the you know blues secret of nim little mice the sisters right the, sister, the older sister and uh and I, I mean when I animated it and then when I pencil tested it, it looked a little almost a little too much like blues like it was obvious <laughs> that I it. Like, right. the way I was doing the <laughs> head bound like and um right. but yeah I I did all that and that with that on my reel that's that thing that I did for myself is how I got. Is, is what they really responded to when I went looking for a job in CG. Mm-hmm. Like I had this whole reel together. And after, you know, I'm sure you lived it. Like after Toy Story came out, like yeah. the world had instantly changed, you know. Um, and you knew CG was a future. So I, I, I put that on my reel. And when we went out to the Seagraph 1997 in L.A., I went with some friends. They were going there. Um I gave my reel out to a bunch of places. Rhythm and Hughes is like there who responded to it. And they called me in and I sat there. And when, you know, they seemed to, they liked all the stuff on my reel that I'd done professionally. But boy, when that rabbit came up singing and those girls, mm-hmm. like, they, oh, you. they're like, like <laughs> they had this huge response. Like, well, you know. I think they respond to stuff that, um, especially when you're you're putting your creativity into it. Uh-huh. Then it's kind of like, well, all of a sudden it comes to life, right? I mean, right. your creativity is on other things, but you're, you know, sometimes the objective when you do scenes on uh, other projects is just to get it to the point where the director says, yeah, that's good, you know? And, yeah. but when you're doing it your way, the way you want to do it, the way you want to see it, like really see it. That's kind of like it just comes out and and you're unfettered, you know, you're just letting the creativity go. And I think that's what they responded to. And yeah. and then, yeah. you know, a lot of times when that happens, you go, oh, maybe I should be doing it more the way I would do it, you know. And then yeah. that's when all of a sudden the whole world kind of like everything loosens up, everything, everything is wonderful, you know. So, yep. yeah. Yeah. I know, but then I guess that's not how it happened. Because then once I got hired <laughs> in the CG, it was like, right? Oh man, I was so restricted. Like <laughs> miles moved on. Like oh god, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I, you know, I, I worked on when I worked for Don Bluth Studios. Uh, I was, uh, I, I came in and I was just, uh, I don't want to say overwhelmed. I, I think I was in, a little bit intimidated because I really liked what they did. And right. so I was trying to do things more like what I would feel they would want 
and it kind of restricted my creativity. That's, 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 mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. So, you know, my scenes were adequate. They were good. They, well, they were drafted well, but they just, I, I don't, I don't think they had any magic to them because it was just, I, I was doing what I thought they wanted me to do and not what I should have done, which was pull it out of myself. And that's why I say that, you know, but Hey. I mean, that I, I think that's very common when, you know, you're trying really hard and you're working with someone that you're impressed by. It's like, holy crap, how am I going to impress this person? And you get stiff. And instead of like when you're doing something that you really are letting your heart do it, where, you know, like with that bunny, when my first pass was mm -hmm. I was I, I had Sharpie because if I knew if I you ever race, it's like it takes you out, it takes you out of the motion. Right. I just, I was Sharpie and I'm going, 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 you know, if it didn't work, I throw it out and I go, 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 you know, I'd strip the pegs if they didn't, you know, this <laughs> raw version, like yeah. you're in there doing this thing. Right. Um, but if it's like something where, oh, that's someone I have to impress. Oh, uh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very, it's very hard. Yeah. I, I found that once I got used to working there and seeing how other people work that I was like, okay, I'm just going to. Just doing it the way I think it should be done and then just yep. let it go. And if they pull me back, yep. they pull me back, you know? Yep. So eventually that's, that's why I did it. But so, uh, rhythm and use hard. Yeah. Yep. Yep. They did. Um, I found out later that it was, um, Chris, Chris Bailey was there Oh, before I got there uh -huh. and, and he, they were looking at reels and they were bringing in people to do, you know, lip sync for whatever babe two or something. Right. And, and he was like, well, they, they had all these CG reels and mine was the one two D one. And he was like, I don't know if I were you guys, I hire this guy. You yeah. Know? Um, so yeah, then they called me. I, it, it, it took a few months. Like Seagraph was in July, and then it got to be 1998, and it was it was the first of God, it was the first of January. And I was like, right, this next year I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna try again. This time I'm gonna really, you know, get sure. a job. I was starting to get myself mentally wrapped, revved up to kind of um, try again to get to LA. Right, and then they called me. I want to say it was New Year's Day, or it, it, which seems weird, but it was either New Year's Day or the day right after where they had called me and they were like, yeah, can you send us some references? Mm -hmm. I was like, sure. You know? All right. So, yeah, then I, I sent some references and they they offered to pay to have me come out there. Um, and then my dad, then, then Character Village was like, well, we want to keep you. But we want to, they were hinting that they were going to close the Chicago office and they were going to bring people over to Ohio. Right. Um, and they're like, so you can move over. If you move over to Ohio, we'll give you this amount of dollars. And this and that. Rhythm and Hughes is going to pay me $15,000 a, um, a year less. Right. And my thought process was like, which I've all, which I always kind of have had since where it's like where is industry going what is the future you know i'm gonna they're gonna move me out to ohio i think rhythm our warner brothers already pulled quest for camelot right 2d is going away <laughs> rhythm is gonna hire me it might be fifteen thousand dollars a year cheaper but they're training me and they're gonna pay to have me move out there so they're paying me to go to school and I'll be out there. And if there's, if I get fired or something, then there'll be other opportunities. So I chose what my dad told me not to do. He's like, well, if I were you, I'd go to Ohio and take the more money. It's the cost of living is cheaper. And my dad was an accountant. Cost right. of living is cheaper and you get more money. You know, why would you not take that? Right. Yeah. But if they fold tomorrow, right. then what do you got? You got all, right. You still got expenses, but you got nothing coming in. Right here, you're you're stepping into an industry that basically this is flound. You know, this two D, you, like you said, two D wasn't doing that well. It was kind of on. Uh, I don't want to say in the outs, but just not the flavor of the month or the year. And yeah. this this you're closer to the business if this 
job faded away, there's other places in LA, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think you made, I the, have right, this, you made the right I decision. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have this uh, stupid story, which I'm a little hesitant to tell, but I haven't told anybody. But like when, like the day I was moving, the day I was moving, like I had gotten my apartment, like it's all packed up. My apartment was gone. Right. And overnight, I was staying at my mom's house one last time. Right. And I, it was around my, it was, my birthday was right around there. And my, my friends that I had all through like this party, that was a half birthday, half going away party. Mm -hmm. And, and I was, I was in my, you know, I was, I was leaving the house and I, it was four in the morning and the airport was nearby. And I was like, all right, it's my mom. And I was like, sad because i was leaving mm -hmm. and i see her freezing out at chicago you know and i i see her like waving out the window i see her silhouette waving out the window as i'm going away i go to the airport and i'm sitting on the airplane i'm like oh god what am i doing what am i doing what am i doing like i like i have all these friends here i have this career that i'm doing pretty good at right i know nothing about cg I didn't realize I had I had ADD. Like I didn't realize it then, but I I I had difficulty knowing technical things. Yeah. So going into CG, I I knew I I I didn't know technical things that great. What am I doing? I wish. I, don't know, I might ask you later to take this out, but I was like, I wish I had a <laughs> sign. I wish I had a sign. I wish I had a sign. I could be here. I don't believe in signs or anything, but I wish there was a sign. I should be here on this plane right now. I don't believe this. And then they're like, all right, the door is closing. I'm like, all right, well, it's going to be nothing like that. So, and uh, the lady's like, all right, well, welcome aboard. We're going to show a movie today. If you want to buy a headset. Mm -hmm. okay. And we, we, there was the days, if any kids are listening to this, they won't understand where everyone had to watch the same damn movie. Like right. everything was in one, like these TVs down the aisle. <laughs> yeah. We all had to watch it. Oh yeah. I remember that. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and even like the headset was like some sort of it I, I don't know what the technology was, but I swear it was some sort of like a stethoscope. Like it was a hollow two. Like it seemed like it was a hollow two. It sounded like, like uh, I, yeah, they were kind of like uh, uh like a more modern version a la, you know, late nineties of a tin can with a, a, a wire attached to another tin can. <laughs> That's Pretty that's much. what it kind of reminded me of, but but it was basically a, this little cheap wishbone uh, yeah. that you put with little suction cups at the end that you put in your ear. It was, ridiculous. <laughs> it was horrible. And yeah, I, I never I never gave my money for that, but this time they were like, "All right, we're gonna show uh, this movie called Picture Perfect starring Jennifer Aniston." Okay, I'm like, I have. I never want to see this movie. I have no interest in seeing this movie, <laughs> but God, I got to get out of my own mind. Right? right. I'm going crazy. Right. So I, I pay the, whatever it was, I think it was a dollar. Everyone had, <laughs> they give her a dollar and you got this headset. Yeah. And I swear to God, this happened. And then she goes, all right, well, as the flight took off, okay, we're going to start. Picture Perfect, starring Jennifer Aniston. But before that, we have a special presentation. We're going to show the 25th anniversary reunion of the cast of Lost in Space. And then <laughs> immediately after that, an episode of Lost in Space. Wow. And I was like... <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't what, believe it. Was that your sign? Yeah, that was my sign. That was my sign. I should be on this plane. And then, I, <laughs> but look, then, like, I know you're saying, did... I know you're saying you want to take this out. Is it, there's more to it? Is no. Well, the, the, well, the people when they started, they played it before Picture Perfect. They started playing that before, right. and all these people went up and they complained, <laughs> and they had to turn it off because they paid the money for picture perfect so they had to turn it off and play it after they played picture perfect oh my god and you're the only person but, that wanted to see it no i don't yeah i was the only person that had like a smile on my face but they did i mean it's a four-hour flight so right. they did after that movie they showed it after do you have any questions or comments about the podcast 
please email Brian at cartoonerific.com. Your email may be featured in one of our future shows. So far, so good. Interesting conversation with Mr. O'Brien. We will have him back next week for part two, so stay tuned for that. Well, I don't know if you're aware, but the Cartoonerific podcast now has about 56 episodes. A lot of interviews, a lot of information, um, and uh, some of them are quite entertaining, if I do say so myself. Uh, Anyway, a couple of days ago, I had uh, somebody contacted me about how to get into the animation medium. And I suggested listening to some of the podcasts. There's so many nuggets in each one of these podcasts about how to approach getting into the field, what schools to go to, what books and things to look at. Um, So it's all there in these podcasts. So I I recommended checking those podcasts out. So with 56, a lot of information there. Anyway, uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. And please tell a friend or two or three or 10 or 20 really helps us out here. Anyway, I want everybody to have a great day. Have an excellent week, and we'll see you all again next time. This has been a Cartoonerific Studios presentation. The Cartoonerific Podcast is copyright 2024 by Cartoonerific Studios Incorporated. All rights reserved.